Hello and good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Katie Stubbs and I lead the public engagement team here at Alzheimer's Research UK. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 11th event in our Lab Notes online series. Today we are hearing from scientists in our Yorkshire research network who will talk about the different ways they use microscopes to study the brain and build knowledge of the diseases that cause dementia. Before we get into it all today, I just want to do a bit of housekeeping. So during the event, you are welcome to switch on the automatic subtitles using the CC button at the bottom of your screen. They're not 100% accurate as they are generated automatically during the live event, but they do get edited so that they are correct on the event recording. If you've missed previous events, you can watch any of them back in your own time as they are all available on our Lab Notes webpage or on our YouTube channel. And during this event, if you would like to ask a question, you just need to click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which will bring up the Q&A box where you can type your question. So now we're going to ask you a few poll questions, because although we can't see you, we're, re we're really keen to know a little bit more about you. So those have just popped up on your screen now, and I'll just pause for a little bit to let you answer those. And these just help us to understand a bit about how you currently rate your knowledge of dementia research, um, why you might be attending today, and whether this is your first Lab Notes event. So it helps us to get to know you as our audience and why you've come along. I think most people, I'll just wait a second more, most people have answered. Um, so now you can see the results on screen. So you can see that many people think their um, knowledge of dementia research is about average. Hopefully we can um, help you improve that today. Um, and we've got a mix of reasons why people are coming today. So a lot of people have a friend or family member affected by dementia, or they care for someone with dementia, or their work is related to dementia. And we've also got um, a mix of people for whom this is their first event and some regulars who have returned. And it's wonderful to have you all. We hope you really enjoy today and get a lot out of what you hear about. So today we have three speakers. So I'm going to keep my intro really short so that we have more time to hear from them. But I did just want to highlight one thing, and that is now that it's well, it's the 1st of September, it's actually World Alzheimer's Month. Um, and this is a global awareness month for all types of dementia, not just Alzheimer's. And so one of the big things that we, we really want to raise awareness of is research and how anyone can get involved. So at Alzheimer's Research UK, we help sign people up to a service called Join Dementia Research, which works to match up volunteers with research studies in the UK. And nearly 50,000 people are registered with Join Dementia Research, but we need many, many more people to sign up to help improve diagnosis, treatment and care. So my request to you today is to have a think about who you know that may benefit from knowing about joint dementia research. So you may um, be able to share posts on social media or you could talk to friends or family or other people about how they could make a difference. You could even think about signing up yourself. So anyone over the age of 18 can sign up both with or without a dementia diagnosis. And there are lots of different types of studies that you could do. So these range from online questionnaires to focus groups, or they might involve brain scans or drug trials. So do check out the website or give us a call and we can tell you much more about it. We've popped the links and phone numbers in the chat for you there. And at today's event, we're hearing from researchers in our Yorkshire Research Network. So this network is one of 15 that we support across the UK providing funding for research, networking and collaboration, and also helping researchers share their discoveries and progress with the public. So our speakers today will all be talking about the insights they've gained from using microscopes to study dementia. And we'll begin with Professor Stephen Wharton, who will talk about research using donated human brain tissue and what we know about the proteins that build up in the brain in different dementias. <clears throat> Then Professor Kurt DeVos will help us zoom in a bit, sharing his work studying brain changes at the level of cells. And then Dr. Steve Quinn will take us down to an even smaller scale 
sharing his work studying particles that are a thousand times smaller than the width of a human hair. And once they've given their talks, I will return to the screen and we'll move to the Q&A session. And you could submit questions at any point during the event and we will answer as many as we can in the time that we have. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Stephen Wharton from the Sheffield Institute for Translational Neuroscience at the University of Sheffield. So over to you, Stephen. Well, thank you very much, um, Katie, for that introduction. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Um, so I'm a neuropathologist um, working uh, at the Sheffield Institute for Translational Neuroscience. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the types of pathology that you can see down the microscope, uh, and then talk a little bit about what we've learned from looking at this in a uh, population uh, sample. Um, so just, just uh, as a reminder, by dementia, we really are referring to uh, the clinical syndrome characterized by a decline in performance from a previously um, high level of ability, uh, progressively lower, uh, of a, se a severity that is um, able to interfere with uh, independence and dementia can affect um, a range of cognitive domains or types of thinking. So that can be the ability to attend to things, find your way around, decision-making, planning, types of learning, and of course, memory. Um, and there are lots of pathological types of dementia. Um, I've just listed three here, uh, the commonest Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and Lewy body dementia. And I'll say a little bit more about the pathology of these as we go along. Uh, and this is just uh, a brain from somebody with, with Alzheimer's disease. And what you can see here is a widening of these spaces uh, between these gyri of the brain. These are the sulci, and this reflects um, tissue loss. Um, so just to say something about Alzheimer's disease first. So this is characterized really by two pathological lesions that you can recognize down the microscope uh, made up of two types of uh, molecule. The first of these is the amyloid uh, beta molecule, uh, which many people think is really um, central to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and um, this is derived from a normal cellular protein, uh, but fragments of this can be uh, cut um, and can be released into brain tissue. Um, and then in abnormal circumstances, these can begin to stick together, forming these small aggregates called oligomers. We know that these can cause damage. Um, and these can further begin to aggregate into these large insoluble deposits called fibrils, which then make up plaques, which we can recognize down the microscope. So this is stained for A beta. And uh, you can see a plaque here. This is outside of cells, kind of within the ground substance of the brain. So these are individual cells here. Uh, the other key molecule is tau, uh, and this is involved in the ability of nerve cells to be able to transport things up and down their long processes. And abnormal tau in Alzheimer's disease uh, again forms these clumps or aggregates, this time inside of cells, forming neurofibrillar entangles. Um, but they can also be present in damaged nerve cell processes around the amyloid plaque. So we see these in two locations. The other major pathology that I, I just want to mention is, uh, is vascular pathology due to damage to blood vessels. And in the past, a lot of the emphasis here was on large blood vessels. Um, damaged by things like atherosclerosis, uh, causing strokes. So here's a brain, and here towards the rear of the brain, you can see quite a large stroke. Uh, and originally, people used to talk about multi-infarct dementia due to having multiple strokes. We now realize that vascular dementia is much more complicated than that. And another very important feature is pathology affecting small vessels. So these are the small arteries that are present within the brain tissue that you really need a microscope to look at. 
And here, this small artery has been uh, damaged, uh, devastated, really, and you can see leakage of blood and blood products into the surrounding tissue. And this can be associated with very small um, microscopic areas of tissue damage. Um, so this is a large stroke called an infarct. This is a micro infarct. And we now know that these can be a marker of um, damage that can lead to cognitive impairment. Okay, so um, we know that, that most of the dementia that we see is in the older population and dementia levels increase as you get older. So in fact, most dementia is in these oldest um, age groups, which may show some differences to the types of dementia that you might see in specialist clinic settings. And I've been involved now for uh, quite a few years with a study called the Cognitive Function and Aging Study, which was led by uh, Professor Carol Brain, who's a, an epidemiologist from Cambridge, um, working with Professor Fiona Matthews, who's a statistician, and this really is a study of dementia and frailty in the UK population based on urban and rural areas. And um, the, the respondents in the study were all identified from uh, GP practices. Um, and so a lot of work's been done to show that this study represents the UK population over 65. Um, and quite a number of people from this study signed up to a brain donation program. So the important thing about this, this is that it's representative of the population rather than pre-selected into clinical groups. And all the cases have undergone neuropathological analysis. So we've had a, a good idea of the kind of pathology that's present within them. So over the years, the, the, the CFAS study itself and studies using tissue on CFAS have been, uh, have supported studies by really a very large range of investigators uh, and hundreds of papers have been produced, quite a lot of neuropathology papers. But I just wanted to cover um, two or three headline points really from the basic aspects of pathology, the sort of thing that you can just recognize down the microscope. Okay. So this study has generated a lot of neuropathological data. And uh, these tables over here, um, well, they show a lot of data. So what have we learned from, um, from all of that if we dive into it? Um, well, first of all, um, in a population setting, um, there are quite a lot of different lesion types, quite a lot of abnormalities that can be associated with dementia. Not surprisingly, the uh, two most common pathologies underlying dementia are Alzheimer's type pathology, tangles and plaques, and vascular pathology. Um, but in fact, a lot of other pathologies contribute to dementia. So there are multiple abnormal brain changes which can add up to um, determine the overall burden of dementia. Um, so it's relatively unusual in the oldest population for disease to be, to be pure genetic disease. Um, and re resulting on from that really, um, multiple pathologies are commonly present in individuals with dementia. And those different pathologies can combine. So dementia really is a multi-morbidity. Um, so we see uh, things like Alzheimer's type pathology, Lewy body, large vessel disease, but also other neurodegenerative pathologies. Um, there are some newly identified pathologies that, that have begun to be described, uh, such as this, um, uh, called LATE by its acronym associated with this abnormal protein. And then also there is a background of cellular aging, which may come. And then thirdly, um, there's quite an overlap in burdens of pathology between demented and non-demented individuals. So if we think about many diseases, they're defined by their pathology. So, you know, if, you, if there's a cancer, the pathology tells you you have it or you don't. 
but in in uh, in dementia, many people over seventy five, most people have got some tangles in the backs. Um, if you look in younger people, and in this context, by young I mean seventy, tangles, plaques here, tangles here, nicely separate individuals with dementia from those without. But if you look into the oldest ages, these graphs start to converge. So in fact, the burdens of pathology um, are less discriminatory for whether people have got dementia or not. And there are some individuals who have dementia, uh, sorry, who don't have dementia, who have quite a lot of pathology. There are also some individuals who have dementia who've got little pathology. So one of the things that we've been interested in over many years is trying to look for some of those factors that contribute to dementia uh, and that modulate the way in which pathology expresses itself. So we don't have time to talk about those, but I just wanted to finish with some implications from these sort of just these neuropathology findings in the population. Firstly, dementia in the population is very complex and often mixed. There are gaps in our ability to model the pathology of dementia, to predict dementia from our lesions. And so we need to understand more even about the pathological basis of dementia. As we begin to identify new pathologies, there may be new op options for treatment of it. But also, there are some really exciting new treatments coming along now, some of which uh, can target uh, single uh, molecules, single pathologies like A-beta. But with this complexity, it may well be that these are not sufficient to treat all of the pathology, all of the dementia in the population, and so a combination may be required. And that suggests that we need a more stratified approach or personal, personalized medicine approach to diagnosing dementia in life um, and to um, treatment. Uh, so thank you very much. Just briefly, I'd like to thank uh, our funders, particularly ARUK and Alzheimer's Society. We've both funded a lot of individual projects within this. Um, and I'm also privileged to work in a very attractive part of the world. Um, so I'd like to hand over now to my colleague, uh, Professor Kurt DeVos. I think I'm unmuted now. I'm going to try and share my screen while thanking Professor Steve Wharton, my colleague here at Citroen, uh, for his nice talk. And uh, what he told you actually helps me in my talk, as you will see in a second. So um, as already mentioned, I'm also based in the Sheffield Institute for Translational Neuroscience. and um, Let's see if I can move my cursor. And so my lab um, is a cell biology lab. And, and basically what we, what we try to find out um, is, is, is the mechanisms by which nerve cells in the brain die in neurodegenerative conditions. And, and traditionally, the main you know, kind of disease we worked on was motor neuron disease, but over the last like 10 years, we, we've been starting to become very interested in frontotemporal dementia, which is what I will talk to you uh, about today. And we also do some work on Parkinson's disease. And, and the reasons why, why we can do all these, these different diseases, clinical diseases um, in one lab is because they have a lot of commonalities. And, and I'll, I'll mention that later um, in the talk. Kurt? Yes. Um, we can't see your slides. I don't know if oh, you can check if they've gone up. Let's let's try. Okay. Uh, I think. You is this yes, we can working? see them now. Wonderful. Right. Thank so, you. So you think after all these um, times we would know by now how to operate this, uh, but clearly not. So, so as I was saying, so, so this slide doesn't have much on it uh, other than what I just said, um, is that we are, we're working on the different diseases and we're interested in a number of um, cellular processes 
uh, that are we, that we think are involved in um, degeneration of the neurons. So, so one is um, trafficking of organelles in neurons, which is called exonal transport. We are interested in mitochondria and ER, which are you know special organelles in the cells, and and we are also interested in protein homeostasis and autophagy. And it's about protein protein homeostasis and autophagy that I'll talk today. So. Let's see now if I can move my slides on. There we go. So Professor Wharton already gave you a bit of an overview and said like, yeah, there's different types of dementias and indeed there are. And, and the type of dementia I want to talk about uh, today is frontotemporal dementia. And, and uh, although it's not Alzheimer's disease, it's actually also quite common. So it's the second most common early onset dementia in the UK and after Alzheimer's. And, and what it characterizes by is that there's specific degeneration in the frontal lobe here of the brain and the temporal lobe. And you can see this here on, on this image of this uh, patient's brain here. You know, you see this, this structure here at the front has been disappearing. And here, this frontotemporal lobe is now, you know, becoming a big gap. And so, what you know, the patients kind of you know present with is then degeneration of these lobes, and it leads to pre behavioral and language changes uh, in the patients. So, most of disease, you know, as you know, dementia, we don't know what causes it. It's so-called sporadic, but in case of FDD, about thirty percent is familial. And that gives our geneticists a chance to find out what the underlying genes are. And we in the lab, we, we like genes because if we have the disease genes, then we can make models um, to study the disease in the lab. You know, so we can't do that if, if we don't know the cause. And the, the gene I'm gonna talk about today is called CNANORF72. So it's basically a C9 is chromosome nine, open reading frame 72. So it's basically just the number of this gene in the chromosome, uh, in, in the DNA. And the reason why we're working on CNANORF72 is because it's the most common, you know, known cause of familial FDD and interesting also of um, ALS. And this is what I said in the beginning, we you know, traditionally work on ALS, but now you know, the most common cause, familial cause of ALS is also the most common cause of FDD. And that is what brought us into the field of dementia. So what we're interested in particularly is, is synapses. And Synapses are what make, you know, are the structures that make the connection between neurons in the brain. So here you can see a brain, and you know, that, you know it could come from uh, Steve Wharton's pathology lab. This is a cut through the brain, and and here in this this gray darker area, you have the cell bodies of the neurons, and then in the white area, there's the axons which make the connections to the other um, cells. So we have about 100 billion nerve cells in our brain, and this you know, is a very nice picture from the brain of a mouse, and then you see a hippocampal structure, and you see here all these cell bodies are sitting together in this layer, and then here these thread light extensions are these axons that go and connect to other cells. So you can see this here in this cartoon, we have a cell body and then, you know, which sits in this layer Then the cell body has this long axon which projects out and that then, you know, goes and connects to another neuron. And here where these connections are made, you can see even smaller in, in the electron microscope graph, you have what's called a synapse and it has this presynaptic compartment which comes from the neuron that is making the connection and then has a postsynaptic um, compartment, which is on the receiving cell. And you already, I'll mention them again later, you already see here these vesicles and they're important to convey the signal from one cell to the other. Now, the reason why we're interested in synapses and these connections between the neurons is because one of the main things you can find in dementia is a loss of connections in the brain. And if you have loss in connections in the brain, then your brain stops functioning properly. And this is why you start getting symptoms like memory loss in Alzheimer's or behavioral changes in FDD. And, and the interesting part of it is that these connections are actually lost before the full neuron is dead. 
because of course, once a neuron is gone, it's difficult to replace it, but we are hopeful that we can you know, find um, ways of restoring the connections between the neurons before the neurons are completely gone. There are kind of neuroprotective mechanisms that can rewire the brain and then hopefully um, should also uh, ameliorate some of the um, clinical phenotypes patients have. So the pathway I, I was gonna talk about today is called autophagy. Uh, autophagy is a Greek derived word for self-eating. And, and, and that's exactly what the pathway does. So it's, you can call it the cellular recycling service. So it's, it's actually very complex, but I, I try to, to make a cartoon. Um, so technically what happens is there's, there's a start of autophagy. You have a little membrane bubble that starts forming. And then you have a protein called P62 that is required to get cargos. And these cargos can be anything in the cell that can be uh, you know, a, a protein that is no longer functional, or it could be some uh, pathology you know, that is related to disease, or it could be organelles that are you know, at, at the end of their lifetime. And all these cargos can, are recognized by this protein P62. And then this is transferred into this starting bubble. And then the bubble closes completely, locking those you know, dysfunctional proteins and organelles away from the rest of the cell. And then eventually a lysosome is brought about and this is kind of you know, like the waste factory of the cell. And once this lysosome bubble fuses with the autophagosome bubble that contains what we want to get rid of, the contents will be you know, broken up apart and recycled for the cell to use again. So if in an analogy, you could say, okay, we have uh, some empty bottles in the cell that we no longer need. The empty bottles are brought into the recycle bin, which is your, your autophagosome. The recycle bin is then emptied and goes to the recycling factory where the glass is melted again, and you can make new bottles um, to start the whole cycle again. Now, the reason why we think this uh, autophagy pathway is important for dementia is, is twofold. So one thing is we know that the autophagy pathway is essential to keep synapses. So in a synapse, it's very active because it's constantly talking to other cells. You, know, you need to have the autophagy pathway to remove and recycle damaged vesicles, mitochondria, proteins, and so on. And so one of the things that needs recycling are these vesicles, which I already pointed to in a couple of slides before, which are the ones that actually you know, communicate to the other cell. So basically how this works, and again, it's a very complex protein, but all you really need to know here is that these vesicles have what's in them, what's called neurotransmitter. And then when the, you know, the neuron gets stimulated, the neurotransmitter is released and then it can act on the next cell, which then you know, gets the signal and, and reacts. So the moment you uh, release your neurotransmitter, this bubble that is now open to the outside is then brought back into the cell by a process called endocytosis, and then it's recycled for another round of release. It's refilled and released. So this happens a couple of times um, until at some point this vesicle is just you know, being you know, at the end of its lifetime. It's, it's, it's been used too many times. And then it goes into the autophagy pathway so it can then get recycled and then we can make new uh, precursors in the cells and then you know, the cycle goes again. So, so it's basically a way of renewing your signaling molecules at the synapse to keep everything working smoothly. And here on, on, on this slide here, this is a picture from the lab where we have this neuron. This is a cell body and this little bit here is, is uh, enhanced. And you can see here in white are the synapses that are on this bit of cell that you know, come from other neurons on this, um, on this slide. Now, the reason why we think autophagy is, is, is key for neurodegeneration is because if you inhibit autophagy in models, so here I give you three examples of mice in which the autophagy pathway has been stopped in the brain, and what these mice get is neurodegeneration. So it looks very much as what, what um, you know, we see in human brain. If you don't have autophagy, the neurons will eventually die. So the idea is then that, you know, 
during aging of disease. There's eventually a loss of autophagy or a reduction of autophagy, and that this, to some mechanism, you know, causes this function in the synapses. The synapses then are no longer functional, and neurons, once they're no longer connected to their neighbors and no longer work functionally, they basically are removed from the brain, and that gives you, in the end, disease. So another clue comes from the pathology, and I actually didn't need this slide now because we just heard from from Professor Wharton, you know, about the pathology of uh, dementia, but. But it is, you know, just to reinforce the point is that basically in every neurodegenerative disease and, you know, Alzheimer's, FED, MND, Parkinson's, they are all characterized by deposits of protein in the brain. Abnormal clumps of protein are found in the brain. And in case of FED, there's three major kinds. So one is tau, which is a protein um, that's specific for neurons. Another one is TDP43, uh, which is the one I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on today. And another one is FUS. And, and under normal circumstances, uh, Professor Wharton just showed that you have these aggregations forming these oligomers, and then you have, in the end, the big plaques. But cells are actually very good at at, at getting rid of these aggregated proteins, and that is what the autophagy pathway does. And so, so, so in most cases, you know, we are constantly bombarded in our cells with proteins that are misbehaving and, and aggregating and so on, but it usually doesn't cause disease. Usually they get, um, you know, um, they get um, cleaned up by the autophagy system. And somehow, you know, probably because you know, one factor is aging, which uh, reduces autophagy, um, you know, one factor is, is probably then that the autophagy pathway is reduced and that lets these aggregates persist and then cause disease. Now, the pathologists have told us for a, a quite a long time that a lot of patients with FDD actually had specific P62. Remember, P62 is the adapter in the autophagy pathway, P62 pathology. And, and this has been known for quite some time. And you know, it, there was a subset of patients with this pathology, but we didn't know why. And so in 2011, the geneticists um, found the gene that was linked to these patients, and this was CNANORF72. So the 70, CNANORF72 gene has, has a big extension in the beginning, which is called a, a hexanucleotide repeat expansion. And because of this abnormal bit of DNA in this gene, um, you, know, you get um, FDD or ALS or both, and, and we don't really know what determines which, which of the two clinical presentations you get. And since that gene was discovered in 2011, we have been working on um, finding out how this mutation in this gene actually causes disease. And we are reasoning always in this is that if we can find out how the genetic disease is, is caused, then we can translate that back to the patients of which we don't know the cause of disease, but they, are, they have the same disease. So we hope, you know, by working on these genetic forms that we can actually, you know, help everybody. And so one of the things we find in disease is that there's less protein. So there's less functional CNANORF72 in the cells. And the second thing is, and they're here again, these CNANORF72s, you know, pathogenic repeats get made into very abnormal protein clumps, which we call dipeptide protein uh, aggregates. So they're just another kind of clump of proteins uh, in disease. So we've done a lot of work and I don't have time to go through all of it, but one of the things we found is that this CNANORF protein of which there's less in disease also has a function in this autophagy pathway. And you can see this here, if we reduce the CNANORF protein in uh, HeLa cells, which are skin cells or in neurons in a dish, then we can you know, get you know, more P62 in aggregates, just like we do in, you know, see it in the patients. And you can see this here, these white dots in these cells, you know, come up, which is the same pathology as the, as the patients. And then here also in the neurons, we see the same thing. So we then looked and we can do this now uh, with technology, you know, iPSC technology, we can now make 
the neurons from patients. So we take the skin cells and then the skin cells of the patients get reprogrammed and then we can make neurons and other types of cells out of them. And so we look directly in the cells of patients that donated their, uh, their uh, cells to us. And this is a different type of assay. It, it's not important to, to understand uh, how this exactly works, but you can see here, here we have a big uh, blob of protein and this is the control. And then here in the patients, we have a lot less of this. So this uh, you know, indicates again that there's less autophagy going on in this patient. And this is a different patient and a control. So again, we have a lot of autophagy in this control, but not in the patient here. And we can quantify it. So what we actually are now funded for to, to buy ARUK to work on is, is to further this work into, um, into CNANORF and how it causes disease. And now we are actually looking into how this CNANORF protein, which we now know affects autophagy, how it specifically affects autophagy in the synapses, because they are the relevant uh, bits of the brain for disease. And, and this is some hot of the press um, uh, data, which hasn't been published yet, but we now have established this model. And you can see this here again, in which we can look at synapses uh, in, in, in a dish by you know, making uh, neurons and staining them up. And again, as I said here, these white dots here are the synapses on this little bit of neuron. And this here is the equivalent, but in uh, neurons in which we remove the CNN-Wolf protein. And as you can see, there's no white dots to be seen on this stretch, and you can quantify that. And so losing CNN-Wolf 72 gives you a reduction in the number of connections in the dish, you know, in the brain, I can't say yet, but in neurons in a dish, we get less connections. And so we are trying to now to work that up. Um, you know, in this project. So in the end, our current model for FDD caused by CNNORF72 is that, you know, because of the reduced autophagy, um, and, and that is twofold because there's less CNNORF, the unfolded proteins, which normally should all go into the autophagy pathway and should get cleared, are now starting to accumulate in the cell because there's less clearance of them. We also have already less synapses and these synapses also will be affected by the extra protein that is here. And that this is then causing the connections to be completely lost and eventually the neurons to lose. And so, so as I said, we kind of looking at the mechanisms of disease, but of course that is all scientifically very interesting, but of course the end goal is to, to actually try and help the patients with this. And so one way we are doing this, and again, this is preliminary data, but it's looking promising, is that we can, if we know the autophagy pathway is down in these, in these cells, in these patients, we can try and increase it again. And this is what we did here in this experiment. So here, the, um, you know, the DPR proteins, you know, the pathogenic proteins, we make them uh, in cells. And then we can treat the cells with autophagy enhancers. And as you can see here, we treat it with two different ones. And you can see this big blob here is reduced and even more reduced with this treatment. And this is the same kind of experiment with or without our autophagy enhancer. And you can see in this lane here, we have a darker band. So we have more pathology. And here, as we retreat with this compound trehalose, we can reduce this down uh, to less uh, high levels. So, so we, are, we, are, we are hopeful that uh, autophagy enhancers might be helpful for this. So just to wrap up the talk, the take home messages uh, of what I said today is that connections between brain cells are important and they are lost early in disease. So we think that is a very early contributing factor. The autophagy pathway, the cellular recycling system clears the damaged parts of cells and recycles them for, for further use. And it's necessary to have a, a functional autophagy system to maintain the connections in the brain. So protein aggregates are the hallmark of FTD and other neurodegenerative diseases. And they're a very good indicator that autophagy is indeed disrupted. And you know, hopefully autophagy enhancing drugs may be a possible 
therapy or at least neuroprotective uh, therapy in uh, disease in the future. So I just want to acknowledge two people in the lab. So, so all of this work started off with Chris Webster when he was a PhD student uh, funded by the Alzheimer's Society in the lab. And, and now the, the, the latest part is taken up by Claudia Bauer, a postdoc in the lab, who is now funded by Alzheimer Research UK to look further into the uh, synaptic role of CNANORF72. And with that, I'm going to end my talk and I'm going to hand over to Dr. Steve Quinn from the University of York. Thank you uh, very much, Kurt, for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Steve Quinn from the University of York, and I run the, the Biological Nanosystems Group. Now, the, the key take home message that I want to make right at the beginning is that the field of single molecule bioimaging is genuinely at the forefront of modern science because it's allowing the very building blocks of human life, so DNA and RNA and proteins, to be viewed and imaged and analysed. But maybe more importantly, and maybe even most importantly, for the first time, it's now allowing the very building blocks of a disease to be uncovered with transformative levels of detail. And so in this talk, I want to showcase how we use single molecule bioimaging approaches to uncover the very building blocks of Alzheimer's disease. Now, as Kurt and Stephen um, alluded to, in an advanced Alzheimer patient, we typically see the formation of amyloid plaques and intracellular tau tangles. The tau tangles, of course, we think are formed through the accumulation of the tau protein and the amyloid plaques through the accumulation of the now infamous beta amyloid protein. Now, these um, hallmarks, we think, typically occur many years before the first clinical symptoms arise. So these are the, the biochemical signatures which appear before the symptoms. And that bodes the question, but why do they occur? Um, when do they occur and how can we stop them from occurring? Now, the beta amyloid protein uh, itself, just to give you an idea of where it comes from, is derived from a much larger intramembrane protein called the amyloid precursor protein. And when the amyloid precursor protein interacts with beta and gamma secretase, which you can think of essentially as little pairs of scissors, we get the release of this green fragment. And this green fragment is our beta amyloid protein. And that protein has an ability to fold and twist and bend into a variety of different shapes. And when it misfolds, it can accumulate together with other similarly uh, folded proteins. And that ultimately leads to the deposition, uh, we think of the, the large plaques, uh, characteristic of an advanced Alzheimer patient. So accumulation of beta amyloid is a major hallmark of Alzheimer's um, disease. But between the single proteins and these large um, plaques, again, we have the formation of a variety of different species. So small clusters, which we call uh, oligomers. And these oligomers are transient in nature, but we don't know too much about them. What we do know is that they generally precede the formation of long stringy like fibrils. And these fibrils, as they fold and twist and bend and really manifest themselves around each other, lead to the deposition of the plaques. But there's a number of gaps in our knowledge um, and some of the main questions are how large are these oligomers and which oligomers are the most toxic? Now, early research pointed towards the fibrils and the plaques as being uh, neurotoxic, but recent evidence now suggests that the oligomers are orders of magnitude more harmful. And that means that we as um, biophysicists need to understand them because if we can understand their structure, we can then understand their function and identify which are the most toxic so that we can then block their, um, their formation. A number of biophysical uh, techniques um, and microscopy based methods have been developed um, to study specifically the fibrils and plaques, like, for example, electron microscopy. Um, a number of biological stains have been developed. Um, but here in York, we're using single mo molecule bioimaging techniques to look at the, uh, the single uh, oligomers on an oligomer by oligomer basis. Now, single molecule bioimaging, you can think of as an extension of conventional microscopy. And we know that when we look down the eyepiece of a microscope, we can very easily, easily visualize objects that are typically millimeters in size. So things like organisms like ants, 
We can identify human hairs so that might be um, several um, tens of microns in diameter. We can spatially differentiate and resolve um, cellular structures and bacteria, but we find it extremely difficult to spatially resolve objects like viruses and proteins and molecules. And that's because of the so-called Abbe diffraction limit. In other words, when we have pro proteins clustering together, we cannot use conventional optical microscopy to identify how many proteins are within that small nanoscopic cluster. So the trick that we use in New York is to attach a small fluorescent dye molecule to each of the single proteins. And the dye that we use is Highlight Fluor 555. And basically this strongly absorbs green light and it's extremely emissive um, in terms of red light. So we send green light into our dye and we get red light out. And that then means that if we take our fluorescently tagged beta amyloid um, proteins and we allow them to cluster together under very well-defined environmental conditions, we then deposit them on our microscope slide, um, direct laser light towards the sample and collect the red light that's being emitted from the dye on our uh, uh, CCD camera that's cooled to about minus 80 degrees, we can see images such as those um, shown on the bottom right hand side of the slide. In other words, we see um, bright spots against a dark background. Now, the way to think about these types of images is much the same way that you would interpret a satellite image. Um, here, for example, you can see an image of the United States of, uh, of America from the, uh, the NASA Earth Observatory. And the key take home message here is that simply due to the abundance of streetlights and lights that might be turned on in office blocks, in apartments, in houses, you can very clearly identify the major cities like, for example, Austin, Atlanta, and, uh, and New York City. If you look at the region near Chicago, again, you can, based on the, the brightness of the spots, identify um, smaller cities, uh, smaller towns and villages, which have far less um, streetlights and uh, office blocks. Now, the point here is that brightness is an excellent indicator of uh, population. And so we can use brightness as a means to identify which of the clusters are largest. So the clusters, remember, contain these fluorescently tagged proteins. The more fluorescently tagged molecules in a cluster, the brighter that cluster becomes. But the fluorescent dye molecules are very similar to light bulbs in that light bulbs have a lifetime. They typically turn off after uh, several months, maybe even a year or so. The fluorescent dye molecules, when we specifically use really high powers of green light, they also turn off, but only after uh, a couple of seconds. So in other words, if I take the image on the, the left-hand side and simply look at these spots in three dimensions, you can see that as a function of time, the spots turn off. In other words, the fluorescence being emitted from the clusters turns off as a function of time. And if I zoom into a single cluster, you can see the turning off events take place uh, sequentially and in a stepwise manner. So that's to say, if I look at the brightness of a single protein cluster, and again, the single protein cluster contains a number of fluorescently tagged proteins, the number of turning off events that I observe corresponds directly to the number of single proteins within a cluster. So for the first time, we can use this trick known as stepwise photo bleaching to identify that this particular cluster uh, contained four single subunits or four single proteins. And so using this idea of single molecule stepwise photo bleaching, we can get unique access to monomer to oligomer um, aggregation. So in other words, we can identify single proteins. So this would be um, trajectories, which so uh, a single turning off event. We can identify the presence of the earliest stages of oligomerization, the dimers. So that's to say two proteins clustered together. We can identify pentamers and hexamers. So those which display five or six turning off events. And we think we can even go as high as to detecting clusters which contain 32 single um, proteins. We can, of course, use brightness as a means to also interrogate the sample population. But using this trick of uh, single molecule stepwise photo bleaching, we can literally look at each individual cluster one by one to build up an idea 
of the types of clusters that might be present in a sample. And this is uh, so-called accessing heterogeneity. In other words, overcoming uh, ensemble averaging to, to really understand the distribution of species that might be present in a sample. And of course, it's become um, quite common now to, to take a photograph uh, of yourself in the lab when you're, you're first uh, generating these results. So here I am with uh, Dr. Alex Payne Dwyer, who built our single molecule uh, microscope, generating these results for the, uh, for the first time. Now, as I say, we can access heterogeneity within sample populations. So on the top left here, we're seeing a sample of amyloid proteins at time zero under very well-established conditions. And what this, this graph is basically showing is the abundance of particles or species on the y-axis and the number of proteins per cluster on the x-axis. So in other words, at time zero, the majority of species are single proteins. There are some evidence of uh, dimers, a few trimers, but really no evidence of larger objects. Then after 15 minutes in our solution, you can then begin to see uh, quite clearly the growth of uh, high order uh, oligomers that progresses even further at time one hour. But the important bit to note here is that after one hour and in the presence of an inhibitor, the sample population essentially remains unchanged. So here we have a system, um, or a single molecule bioimaging system that not only is providing us with a new understanding, in other words, allowing us to unveil the sample heterogeneity and understand how many, for example, dimers there are relative to trimers. And remember, the reason we want to, to understand the population is because we think that each individual oligomeric form has very different and distinguished uh, uh, toxicity. But the single molecule bioimaging approach is also allowing us to perform effective and efficient um, drug screening. So we have a situation, just to summarize, in Alzheimer's disease, where the single proteins can cluster together into fibrils and plaques via oligomers. And whilst a number of tools and techniques have been developed to identify the structure of the fibrils and plaques, Single molecule bioimaging, which again uses fluorescently tagged beta amyloid proteins, is giving us new insights, transformative levels of detail into what we think is the earliest stage of uh, the disease. Um, we have now published this work in the journal Methods. So for those of you who'd like to learn more about our study, um, I refer you to the paper titled Amyloid Beta Oligomerization Monitored by Single Molecule Stepwise Photobleaching. That's now available um, online open access for everyone to, uh, to read and view. And finally, I'd just like to thank everyone involved in the project. This is genuinely uh, a true mixture of physicists who build the single molecule microscopes, the chemists who enable the, um, the biological objects to be attached to glass microscope slides, which incidentally is not an easy um, feat, and the biologists who help us with fluorescent um, labeling. Uh, thanks also to Alzheimer's Research UK, because genuinely, without the support of Alzheimer's Research UK's um, funding, we would not be able to perform projects such as this. And thanks also to the EPSRC for providing support, um, especially to our PhD students. Um, and with that, um, thank you for your attention. And I'll now hand uh, over to um, Katie, who's now going to run the Q&A session. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. And thank you to our other speakers. We'll just wait for those uh, those two to join us back on screen. Um, I'm aware that we might run over a little bit today, so we are going to try and do some more questions and probably go a bit beyond four o'clock. So hopefully most of our attendees are able to stick with us just a few minutes longer um, than planned. So we've had some questions come through. Please do keep submitting. We will try and do as many as possible. I think I'm going to do my first one to uh, Stephen, to you, because the first question we had come through was, how do you know which part of the brain to look at? So as a pathologist, you've obviously other people before you have decided that. But um, yeah, talk to us a bit about different parts of the brain and how you know which ones to look at. Yeah, so, so that's a very good question. Um, uh, and there are a number of, number of parts to that. First, firstly, we would sample multiple brain areas. Um, but you can't look at everything. So that sampling is going to be guided by um, what you know of the brain functions. So if you know, for example, that, that a particular function is affected in a 
particular individual, then you're going to sample that particular area. And then the other thing that we know about pathologies like Alzheimer's disease is that they involve the brain areas in a particular pattern. It's very stereotyped. So you know, tau pathology starts off in the in this kind of um, what's called medial temporal lobes, the hippocampus, which is involved in memory and kind of then spreads out into the cortex. Um, amyloid has a slightly different pattern of spread. So you can you can sort of select your sampling based on what you know of the way that diseases involve the brain. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and then one, I think that kind of cuts across both Kurt and Steve's work. So Kurt, you talked about trying to recycle proteins and that could be a way to treat it. But also Steve, you talked about trying to understand how these proteins accumulate in the first place. So we've had a question that says, does the mechanism of autophagy explain the accumulation of neurofibrillary tangles in Alzheimer's disease? But I wonder also if there's the other part to that of the production. So Kurt, should we come to you first to talk about that? Yeah, I can try. Uh, I, 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 well, I think the short answer is 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 almost certainly no. Um, but it's, so so basically, what I was so there's two things here, right? So so technically, cells are good at getting rid of what they don't like, and and one of the ways to do that is autophagy. So 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 I think if we're talking early pathology. You know, kind of more at the level is what um, Steve was talking about, these oligomers and these, these kind of before you have big plaques and big tangles. Then in normal circumstances, if your brain is healthy and the cells are healthy, then, then a lot of that will be cleared. But there's clearly something that happens, and it's possibly getting older. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do about that. That, that starts affecting these processes. And, and then, you know, if you then have a certain accumulation, then probably that will then break through the kind of barrier and then you'll get, you know, larger aggregates which aren't cleared anymore and so on and so on and so on. So, 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 so the, the tau pathology, I don't think is, the, is caused because there's not enough autophagy, but I think autophagy could help in the early stages of this starting to happen to, to kind of prevent it or slow it down. Brilliant. So then, yeah, it's coming at it from both sides, trying to get rid of anything that's built up, but also understanding why it's building up in the first place, which I guess is what, Steve, you're doing. And actually, we've had a question, Steve, um, about whether, do you see in the future the possibility of using your technology to ever look at brain tissue samples to try and understand what's happening in those or is that years off well i, I think that's the um the million dollar question that's that's where we would want to go as single molecule biophysicists we want to be able to study uh, you know these single proteins inside the the, the living um, organ um, right now we are very very good at studying single proteins under very very well defined conditions so we can study the proteins as we, for example, switch the pH, as we change the salt levels inside the solution incrementally, as we change the temperature. And we're starting as a community, um, and I mean um, researchers across the world, at investigating single molecules and single molecule clustering within cells. Um, but we're not there yet at imaging um, uh, single molecules within the, the living organ. That's ultimately where we want to Want, want, want to go. And we also want to image these proteins without the fluorescent tags. What we have to remem remember is that the fluorescent tag is not natural, right? Um, we think based on our evidence that it doesn't in, uh, perturb the, uh, the, the function of the protein in our hands. Um, but that's not to say that it might have an adverse effect inside a, a living cell. Um, so yes, that's where we want to go. Not there yet. We are very good at studying the proteins under very well-defined conditions in the absence of the many hundreds and thousands of biochemical signatures that also go on that you don't see inside the living cell or in the, the, the organ. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, we've had a question from Patricia, which I think probably is best for Stephen as a 
neuropathologist and she's asking does calcination in the or calcification in the brain cause or contribute to different types of dementia I don't know if you have anything to comment about buildup of calcium in the brain um so I think I think not not really um so um so I think certainly in Alzheimer's disease, a lot of the neurodegenerative diseases, you, you don't really see deposits of calcium within the brain. Um, in, in vascular dementia, you can sometimes see deposits of calcium in small blood vessels, which can uh, is a reflection of damage to those small blood vessels. Um, it, it's a little unclear what role that calcification uh, represents, but that's that's really the circumstances in in which you see it. So, but by and large, particularly things like Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's, calcification is is not a feature. Um, which is not to say that calcium as a molecule doesn't have a role to play, which it does. Mm. Thank you. A very good answer there. Um, I think for our final question, I'm going to take one that's come through about oligomers. Um, so I wonder if Steve, you might be wanting to take this one. So the person asks, what sort of foods contain oligomers? Should we be, should we be trying to reduce intake of protein rich food? I wonder if you care to comment about how these proteins are produced in the brain. So I, I think um, broadly speaking, this question also relates to diet. Is, is, is diet related to the accumulation of the, of the clustering? And this is exactly where our, our research is heading. We want to understand the environmental conditions inside the brain that induce the clustering. So we know that, for example, sodium chloride levels are, are important. We know that when we switch the, the, the pH, in other words, switch the solution from alkaline to more pH, that seems to speed up the clustering. Now, I'm not suggesting that um, what, you, what you eat is uh, necessarily linked, but what I am suggesting is that the environmental conditions are really quite important. Um, I don't think that the link between the oligomer assembly and uh, specifically diet is, is well established, um, but there does seem to be links um, uh, be between the beta amyloid protein and other organs in, in the body. So. Um, I think watch watch this space is the is the take home. Mm. I guess it's that message that the protein we eat in our diet then gets broken down to its basic blocks that then get built up into these other proteins. So we don't that it does. There's no clear link between what we're eating and the proteins that that happens. It's not that those then get kind of put in places. It's they're broken down and then rebuilt again into these other proteins. So yeah, we need to understand that. But there isn't any evidence at the moment that um, high protein diets could could lead to this build up so wonderful i think in the interest of time we're running over a little bit but i think we just wanted to get through a few more questions so i just want to take this opportunity to thank our three speakers Stephen, kurt and steve thank you so much for taking us behind the scenes of your work and giving us some insight it was really wonderful to hear yeah. thanks everyone for attending and thanks uh, katie for uh, for organizing this Thank, Thank you, very you very much. much. Wonderful. So if the if people watching just bear with me because we just have a, a few more things to go through. So um, before you go, we've just got a couple of poll questions to go through again to help us understand how you found today um, and uh, how it went for you. So I'll pause for a second while you can answer those. So I was trying to understand if you would recommend these sorts of events to people, whether you think you've learned anything new and um, dare I ask if you would plan to attend uh, a future Lab Notes event. So I'll just give you a few moments to fill those out. So I think most people have done that now. So we can see the results here um, and it's positive, which is really good to see. Um, so people agreeing that they would recommend these types of events to their friends and family, um, that they feel they've learned something and uh, that you would plan on attending future Lab Notes events. So that's really wonderful to hear. We'll be sending a more detailed feedback survey to you tomorrow um, and the video recording will likely come later in the week. 
please do fill out our survey as we'd appreciate any kind of more detailed feedback you can give us. We're also gathering input into next year's series um, of Lab Notes. So we'd love to hear from you about what you want to hear about and what makes these events work best for you. Our next event in this series is on Tuesday, the 21st of September at 1 p.m., which also happens to be World Alzheimer's Day, which is kind of the highlight moment of World Alzheimer's Month. And at that event, researchers from our Southwest network will share their research into different types of brain cells that are involved with Alzheimer's. And they will discuss how these long overlooked brain cells are now known to have key roles in the disease processes that cause dementia. So you can find out more and sign up on our website to join us for that event and some more that are coming up this year in the series. If there are questions that um, you didn't ask or you didn't feel able to ask or that you would like to find answers to, um, I just wanna highlight our dementia research info line. And they're there to answer questions about dementia research. They can also signpost you to other sources of information and support. And they can also help you sign up to take part in research studies, as I mentioned earlier in the event. So do get in touch with them as they are always on hand to help. So as we close today, I want to say a huge thank you for joining us. I hope you found it interesting and useful and that you will come along again for another event in our series. Thank you and goodbye.